Hello and welcome to the space. We've got four of us live today from the Jade City team. We have Will and Kevin, Otto and myself. Kevin is new to the spaces and another member of our founding team, as well as our Jadeite and mining expert. So hello, everyone. Hi, hi. How are we doing, Tom? Beautiful. Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Mike, yeah, Mike is on. Brilliant. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Hi, Tom. Awesome. Okay, and um, we're waiting for Will to come in, but just before then, so the topic today is Jadeite the Gemstone, and we're going to focus on what makes Jadeite such a unique and interesting asset to be bringing into this Web3 world. Uh, and then we'll answer any questions. So if you do have any questions, you can comment them below the space and we will answer them live. Um, so as Kevin, you're here, we'll move straight on. Um, so Kevin, would you care to introduce yourself a bit more and, and outline what you'd like to talk about this evening? Okay, thanks, Tom. I'm Kevin Fu, Chairman of Jade Resources Limited, the Hong Kong company that owns a jade mine in Kazakhstan. I'm also chairman of Jade Vault, uh, a new company we created in the UK last year, and that's buying jade from Jade Resources, and we're going to do amazing things with it. In in mining terms, I'm a 50-year-old, 50 50-year 50 veteran, worked all over the world, and a lot of that time I've spent in Kazakhstan and Russia, and my own Jade Road journey, as as I'll discuss through this, this chat, was when in 2009, Gia Nortis, my great friend and our current head of US operations, introduced me to Bulat Gelim Geriev, Jade Resources CEO, who was interested in a jade project near Lake Balkash in east central Kazakhstan. Uh, now, later on, Mark Denning, the renowned fund manager, became a shareholder in 2016, and here we are, uh, 2023, four of us still talking to each other and great friends and active managers in JRL. Uh, fast forwarding to early 2022, Paul Zatoski introduced me to James Bowater, the legendary crypto guy <coughs> and founder of Jade Vault. And uh, James in turn reconnected me with Will Ralston Saul, who I uh, worked with in a project in Tajikistan um, 10 years before that. And here we are again. I love talking about arcs and how things go out and come back and the sliding doors thing. In the next 30 minutes, uh, I hope to show you how Jade has formed, where to find it, its amazing history and why it's so valuable and enduring, and then talk a bit about my journey along the Jade Road, what we've discovered and what we're planning to do next. Um, Perhaps, Tom, I could continue on and talk a little bit about jade. Uh, it just describes a precious stone. Yeah. There's, there's dozens of these uh, with the word jade in it, white jade, blue jade, and pretty much you can bet <coughs> that none of them are actual real jade. The only real jade minerals are nephrite, a calcium, magnesium silicate, and jadeite, a sodium, aluminium silicate. They're both rocks. Um, and I'll explain why a little, a little later. Uh, nephrite has always been a bit of a problem for me and other mineralogy aficionados because it's really a complex mix of minerals. Uh, it's not one mineral, and they can vary a lot, and sometimes they can become not nephrite. But don't have any doubt, some nephrites and jade articles from mainly archaea, you know, Historic times, um, BCs in China can be extremely beautiful. Jadeite, which is my favourite, is a is a mineral, but as a gemstone, it's uh, sold as a what I call a, a mix of three minerals, a solid solution in technical terms. And the three minerals are jadeite, which you've heard of, obfacite, which you haven't heard of, and cosmochlor, which is another mineral that you've not heard of. Uh, I regard jadeite as much, much better than nephrite because it's rarer, very rare, denser, harder, more transparent, more valuable, and only the best jadeite can ever be classified as imperial, which is sensational and extremely super rare. Um, 
It's very hard mineral, uh, 7.5 to 8 compared to diamonds of 10. It's a very dense mineral uh, with 3.3 to 3.6 density, whereas quartz is 2.6. It's cold to the touch. It resists acids, alkalis, heat, cold and cutting. And in many respects, it's almost indestructible and an ideal tool for, uh, ironically, cutting and building. Sounds pretty resilient. It is, it is. Uh, So that's the kind of introduction. Um, I can go on and talk, if you like, about some geology and hopefully not put too many people to sleep, but I'll I'll try and keep (laughs) it simple. How would be how, great, how, yeah. How, um, I mean, yeah, based on you know how it's formed and the geology, I mean, yeah, go for it. All right. Confession, when I first started looking at jade in this deposit back in 2009-10, I thought, jade, oh, yeah, the Chinese like that and it's valuable. What I really didn't know why and I thought it was just another rock. But the more I've learned about jade, I, the more I understand and respect why it's been revered for millennia, you know. Jade technically is called a plate tectonic gemstone, meaning it forms only along where the, uh, the plates, tectonic plates, suture up and down and, and uh, break up and reform and so on along those those boundaries, uh, very much like a lot of gold deposits. Um, its parent rocks formed billions of years ago and. Uh, thousands of kilometres below the surface down in the Earth's mantle. But when these tectonic plates started to rub over each other, and in the case of jade, when a plate flows under another, the process of jadeite formation can begin. It's still hundreds of kilometres below the surface at very high pressures, but a relatively cool two to 300 C. Um, Now, When the tectonic plate falls in, it brings a lot of water, and you're talking uh, plates that are tens to almost hundreds of kilometres deep, and that's an awful lot of water that floods in. And then these come in and and then are released into the sub-oceanic crusts, and and that high pressure forces the solutions enriched with sodium and aluminium and silica and sometimes chrome and these things to flow up into the overlying rocks. And then these in turn become altered and eventually solid jadeite veins form. So you have a solution, like a salty solution, that goes up hundreds of miles into the mantle and then into the crust and then it starts to precipitate out as jadeite veins. When that process is finished, you're still 80 to 100 kilometres below the surface and uh, you know that uh, presents a problem how do you you get that jadeite to the surface and principally it just continues its journey because the the leakage paths around the tectonic plates have been scarred and bashed around and folded and cracked and so it tends to leak uh, under the pressure that it's still behind it it pushes up slowly and surely over millions of years uh, and earthquakes and so on up towards the surface. Now, jadeite and serpentinite, which is its kind of sister mineral where all that water goes when when the, the jadeite sheds it, um, is more buoyant and, and somewhat carries the heavier jadeite upwards. But that's a theory, not, not proven. Uh, but... As the process goes, the jadeite veins break up, they reform, they have many, maybe maybe thousands of cycles of fracturing and reforming, all like the tempering of a steel sword, if you can think of it that way. Uh, These, to me, the stunning thing about the geology is that these super unique conditions, you're talking one in billions of chances, are why jade is, is very, very rare. Jadeite is very, very rare, and only 16 deposits known in the world exist. Uh, And only two of these in Burma, the Burmese jade deposits, and in Guatemala are actually in operation. Now, with the Murundi in Kazakhstan in operation, we now have three. But the odds of finding a jadeite deposit are super, super rare. One in billions, okay? Mm. 
and I guess that and this is why it's uh, been revered throughout history uh, because of its rarity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, how about the history of jade and and the, and the jade road? Yeah. Well, we'll we'll study the history too, and I'll probably let him have a chat. But I don't think my knowledge, Kevin, will ever quite be yours. <laughs> I can't, I've probably got like five sentences of knowledge where you've got maybe 500. I've, I've had a, a bit of a start on you. Have a go, yeah. I'll correct you when, well, when, it's, when, it's, when, it's when I see a mistake. Yeah. a very, very yeah. long time. Yeah. My general ignorance of how long humans have been on the planet, uh, in terms of uh, Homo sapiens, uh, you know, it's it, I, we, we've been around, I think, a couple of hundred thousand years. And it looks like there's examples of, of jade, use going back as far as 35,000 BC, which is absolutely... Oh, am I still there? Sorry. Yep, um, you're back. Yeah, you? I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. I've got to you. Do not step on the phone. All right. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's an extraordinarily hard uh, material and therefore useful uh, as a tool. Uh, one of the... I did see one example that it was useful was used as an anvil. Um, in, in, in Smith work. Obviously, that's later, but that just gives you some idea of like how hard it is if you could use it as an anvil. For, for where it comes to the Chinese, um, sorry, Kevin, I probably just missed out about 12,000 years of history. It's all right. But in, in terms of my understanding, you know, the Chinese um, traded, uh, you know, nephrite for thousands of, nephrite jade for thousands and thousands of years. And it wasn't until the sort of 14th century that the Burmese jade started to appear on the market um in china and you know it's the burmese jade which is jadeite is way more beautiful uh for the average person uh than nephrite and therefore this became the thing that 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 everybody wanted and it became more valuable um and also it 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 was harder um but at the same time easier to work with um so that was and and you know and, and and that continued but it wasn't actually until 18 something uh that some scientists actually did the work uh and, and proved that nephrite jade and jade I jade were two totally different things um and uh you know and it's continued up up until this very day to be very very valuable i mean in china the diamond market and the jadeite market are approximately the same size according to the latest data that I've seen. So it just gives you some idea of how much of it is traded. Um, Kevin, if, you could probably add a lot more to my uh, my meager knowledge of jade history. No, I think that's great. I, I, I would like to mention the Jade Road, um, which kind of began about 12,000 BC, continued through, and uh, uh, it pre uh, was the predecessor by thousands of years of the Silk Road. Where, you know, um, Westerners know a lot about the Silk Road, but the Jade Road was really, in my belief, and, and a lot of Chinese scholars believe that this was the forerunner to the Silk Road and was actually the gemstone that paved the way for exchange between East and West. And that Jade Road, um, I just wondered oftentimes whether the Chinese traders on that ancient jade road as they passed by Lake Bol Cash in Kazakhstan, which is on the jade, on the Silk Road, or certainly on the Jade Road anyway, could they have picked up some samples from the surface exposure 5,000, 7,000 years ago? Um, well, clearly they didn't pick up too much if they did, otherwise they might have had it mined by that and imagine what would have happened this would have changed the world. And, and these kind of possibilities when things are like that are just amazing to think what could have happened. Um, but as as Will said, you know, jade, I, jade became the popular and uh, higher-valued form of, of uh, jade in the 14th century and then it got really active around the turn of the you know, 1900s. It became very popular. Uh, and why, you know, they, they say that gold is valuable but jade is priceless, the Chinese say this, and I, I think this is because jade is very different to other gemstones and precious metals. There's no such thing as a jade price, and it's not a single polished or cut crystal. It's, you know, 
interlocking microcrystal crystals and comes in all sorts of colours, shapes, sizes, and even the impurities in grains uh, and breakage is almost sometimes cracks give it character, uh, and therefore each piece of jade is unique. And when a craftsman looks at a piece of typically Burmese jade, they do have flaws, so he looks at how he can turn those flaws into things of beauty. And that gives the whole piece a spirit and some character, and then if it's really high-quality jadeite, people pay thousands if not millions of dollars for those pieces of jewellery and that's that's the thing about jadeite its uniqueness and the the emotional impact it has on people i think that um that fact that each piece of jade is totally unique it's almost like each piece of wood has its unique grain I yeah. mean, to me i think of it it's almost exactly like that right it's like totally unique there's not even one piece that's remotely similar uh so you know when it comes to use doing nf you know make scanning pieces of jade and turning them into nfts um for for digital trading of them i mean they couldn't it's like they couldn't be a a, a gemstone better to do it with i mean with diamonds it's quite difficult because unless you're a super expert i don't think you can see the difference between you know as the average onlooker it, it, all the diamonds look the same to me of a similar size you know whereas jade, yep. it's easy yep. Any, anybody can see a unique piece indeed yeah going on from history i understand it's it's already been a long journey for you and and jade resources uh if you're happy to tell us some more about it yeah sure uh i'll uh, summarize 13 years of graft and emotions and uh, stuff in, into a minute. <laughs> uh, back in 2009, to, uh, 2009, I signed, I actually signed a deal with the Itma Rundiona, a really bad-tempered old Russian who I actually never liked, but he, he turned out okay in the end, but and only when we paid him a lot of money for his mine. But, um, <laughs> but I took an option, basically, to look at it and then I'd pay for his kind of sustaining costs and costs of maintaining the license and so on because uh, I, I needed time to study the project, learn about jade. I wanted to make sure we understood the geology and, you know, the size and structure of this thing, uh, its mining potential, the mining methods and, and basically very importantly confirmed that the actual mineralogy of the jadeite was exactly that. It was confirmed as jadeite, not some other jade-like stone. Uh, we did a lot of work, uh, mainly internationally, and we, we did work with Swiss Gemological Institute, mineralogists in Australia and the US, and we confirmed that the deposit was indeed jadeite, hosted by its good friend Serpentinite, and I didn't have the funds to buy the mine, uh, but then I met Mark Denning, who I'd known for some time in 2016, um, and he asked me, incidentally, oh, what else was I up to? And I said, well, I've got a jade project in Kazakhstan. I explained it to him, and immediately Mark got it. He said, I'm in. Sounds fantastic. So, so he uh, funded the, uh, uh, the money to buy the mine, and, and then once we, had the money, once we owned the mine, uh, we ap ramped up activity significantly and then started to look into the Chinese-Burmese relationship because the Burmese produced 95% of all, all the jade that went into China. And that's when my son James stepped up and said, Dad, I'll, I'll go and live and work in China and Burma and look at the market and let's see how we understand it. And he did that for over four years. And he understood the way the industry works, uh, the markets work in Burma, how the Chinese trading works, the manufacturing, the jewellery industries, and answered a lot of our questions because the jade world is very opaque, but it's very amazing. Kevin, one yeah, thing right. that I was, um, you know, found interesting because, you know, Burma's, because basically all the jadeite in the world, apart from the tiny bit from Guatemala, basically all comes from Burma. Yep. Burmese jadeite is considered to be the gold standard, just like a Burmese ruby or something like that. So Correct. Yep. something that people often, you know, say, well, you know, does, is this Kazakh jadeite, you know, is it different to Burmese jadeite? And what, and what I've always 
you know, what's been good is in part of James's work and time he spent in Burma was, you know, bringing samples from Kazakhstan to Burma and then mixing them up with Burmese yeah. samples and seeing if traders who spent their entire life trading jade can actually pick the Kazakh ones from the Burmese one. And according to James, they never could. So I think no. that's a pretty positive sign. Yeah, the, the blind tests, he did hundreds of them, I think, uh, uh, because... You know, if a if a trader can pick the difference, yeah. But because of my kind of techie approach, I wanted to make sure that mineralogically they were very similar. And we'll talk about that maybe a bit later. But uh, the, the the field tests were really a good a good test of what we had. Uh, what have we got achieved in thirteen years of work? Well, we spent an awful lot of money, but we have achieved a lot too. Got a massive knowledge base about our amazing mine, its quality, and how the jadeite industry works. We've confirmed that Itmarudi is the largest primary deposit in the world, currently reserves of 220,000 tonnes. And with additional work and uh, a little bit more drilling and development, we're very confident we could take that to 650,000 tonnes or more. And believe me, there's no other deposit like this of this size or this volume and shape in the world. Uh, remembering there's only 16 known deposits in the world. Uh, from this beautiful mine, we can make large blocks of jade, up to 60 tonnes, you know, and we have been doing that uh, in recent mining. Uh, boulders, blocks, pebbles, and all the jadeite from the mine can be sold. No, nothing really is wasted. What is our jade? It, it, it's actually genuine what they call fetsui, which is re the recognised Chinese standard in Hong Kong, China, and now part of the world, including the Gemological Institute of America. And a sort of simplified definition of fetsui is that fetsui jadeite is a granular to fibrous polycrystalline aggregate composed of jadeite, omphacite, and cosmochlor, solely or in any combination. That means that our mine, Itmarundi, has all three of these Fetsui components in variable quantities. And this is very similar to the Burmese jadeite, which also has those three minerals in variable qu quantities. Uh, let's talk a little bit about imperial jade. Uh, according to our reserves, about 0.5% of the ore body is classified as imperial. Uh, and this is where previous owners and developers, I think, mistakenly mined only for Imperial. They were seeking, you know, the massively valuable, you know, thousands of dollars per kilogram uh, Imperial jade. And they didn't really look hard enough at what was surrounding them, you know, lovely, regular uh, jadeite lying in, you know, in plain sight. Now, we took a more... Uh, engineering approach we, we looked at the geology the mineralogy and we didn't bother hunting around for the imperial we wanted to see what was in these other big rocks that were part of the monoliths and the mine and we confirmed that all of it was uh, fed sui jadeite not just the nice green looking stuff that's nice uh, mm -hmm. and in a way uh, our, our move into you know, luxury architectural stone rather than selling jewellery in, into the market uh, is a bit of, again, of history reversing itself. And the other important thing we've learnt is that Burmese jade, because it's primarily alluvial rocks and pebbles, just can't compete with us because uh, by, by its geological nature, all they can do is make jewellery products and ornaments and stuff like that. You can't make a tabletop or a bathtub out of pebbles. We can make lots of architectural stone material and products, including bathtubs uh, and uh, other, other luxury stone products that we, we will be getting into. And that is another distinction that we have. Mm. And these are items that have never been made before. Okay. Never, never. We can guarantee you, you know, some of the products we've looked at, we're looking at and are on our uh, beta tests at the moment. We've made a lot of products in, in test in, in situations in China. 
and none of these have been you know, been made before. So it's really, really interesting. I think on the on the bathtub front, there's two interesting things. One is um, if 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 you're um, somebody who uh, who um, you know is into the kind of healing healing properties of crystals and stuff like that, uh, jade is is considered to be a stone with a very lucky and with a lot of healing properties. And there are you know a lot of people who who are who are into that. And uh, so having a jadeite bathtub is kind of the the ultimate sort of healing and the <laughs> of, of, of the bathtub so that's that's something and another interesting fact and and, and i've been told on, on very good uh from a very sort of i would say respected source of um of, you know that there would be massive demand uh for that kind of thing when i say massive i mean not obviously a huge amount of bathtubs but you don't have to sell very many uh, the most expensive bathtub ever sold, I believe, was sold for somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million dollars, and it was carved out of crystal. Hmm. So I can only wonder if if a bathtub <laughs> carved out of crystal, and crystal's not a particularly rare thing, it's certainly not nearly as rare as jade, sold for that kind of money. Uh, I wonder. I wonder what a jade bathtub would be worth. Yeah. Well, we're taking orders, Will. <laughs> um, exactly. it, it'll weigh about three tons if you want one. So, uh, <laughs> uh, gonna have to increase my overdraft limit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, we can ask you more about the price of of Burmese jadeite generally, and and how that market works in Burma. All right. Um, I've looked at, naturally. I've looked at it, and James, my son, has looked at it for a long time. Uh, and, and Will started to look at it. Will's coming up to speed on jade pricing and uh, you know how the you know, how difficult it is to really work out what what some of these Burmese prices mean. But I'll have a go. You know, uh, people do say, "What's the price of jade?" And I answer, say, "Well, what's the price of diamond? It's a precious stone, the same as diamond. What's the price?" And because the jadeite industry has been opaque forever, you know. And getting any kind of data out of it is nearby impossible. Um, you know, you, you've got to value what you do get. And probably one of the be best reports to come out was done by Global Witness, the group in London here, uh, in 2015, where they analysed a 10-day auction in Mandalay in Burma and another one in 2015. Uh, and they estimated that for that market, the official rough jade height uh, was uh, they extrapolated that market when there's about eight per year. They took that and multiplied it by eight fundamentally, but they estimated that for that year, the trade of rough jade height was in excess of $30 billion US. The actual price of utility jade height, and what, what I didn't say is that jade height's roughly classified into very high quality quality imperial and, and high grade, um, which is kind of sub-imperial but still regarded as the best investment. Then you have commercial, which is what most jade jewellery is made out of, and utility is what lesser value jade jewellery and other products are made out. So the average price of utility jadeite was $505 a kilogram, not a tonne. Uh, this may have been an exceptional year, and Will and I are actually having a look at this to see, you know, I think it was, but how exceptional was it? Uh, we're not quite sure. And there's other studies done by Harvard University and the UN that provided some other useful data points. Uh, but all of these are around official exports. And these range from, I think, about 44,000 tonnes in 2010 to a low of, two, in 2021, it was only 8,500 tonnes the official Burmese ex exports, uh, uh, 8,500 tonnes. However, you know, official numbers are grossly underestimated because, according to Global Witness, up to 80% of Burmese jade is unofficial or smuggled. Therefore, you can multiply those figures, those official figures, sometimes by three to five. Now, in the time frame from about 2010 to the future, we would estimate that uh, rough jade sales 
over that period can range from a high of about $36 billion. And then this is, again, I stress, this is the official figures uh, and to, down to a low of $6 billion. Uh, it looked like that was around in 2018. And similarly, kilogram prices, and I'd ask Will to have a, a say on this, range maybe from $50, $50 a kilogram very low to half a million or a million dollars a kilogram. But the sort of common spread is around 200 to, you know, 1,000 or so, 2,000. Would, that, would you agree with that, Will? Yeah. No, I think I think so. There's, um, you know, like I said, the data is quite opaque, so it's kind of hard to get a, 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 a an, an exact answer. Um, but, yeah, from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand, that's the utility range and the commercial range. Um, but, you know, I, I would say to people, it's almost like zero to infinity because, you know, there was a single necklace, a bead necklace, Admittedly, the beads were quite large, but still, a bead necklace sold for like $27 million. <laughs> so that's like the very extreme on what, one level. You know? Yep. And then, you, and then you've got that sort of, you know, nasty stuff. It's not really proper jadeite, but kind of classified jadeite stuff that, you know, could be dollars. Yeah. Or, you know, but... Correct. But it ain't. But it ain't our jadeite. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not ours. I mean, in, no. our, in our financial model, we... We've estimated that the equivalent Burmese jadeite to what ours is, so if you take the average quality in our, our deposit, is, is sort of five to $600 a kilogram if you were to buy mm -hmm. them in Burma. Yeah. Uh, but in our financial model, we've used like $50 a kilo. So we've been, we've been very conservative. Um, and then, you know, Jade Vault, working with Jade Resources, is buying it. Um, well, the first five million, uh, sorry, the first five million kilos were buying at about seven dollars a kilo. So um, there's, you know, the, I mean, we're buying it basically at one percent of the Burmese <laughs> price, yeah. which is a pretty nice deal, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about supply because I, I wanted to tell the listeners about the the supply side and what I think. Um, and I'm, I'm a data bug, as you all know, and, and I got hold of a Chinese paper which we had translated, which was a summary of the annual China Jewellery and Jade Jewellery Association uh, white paper. Um, the Chinese are pretty well into documentation too, which is great. But what this showed is that Burmese auctions stopped in 2019 and have not reopened since so that the auctions of jade have not simply not happened. Now, that does coincide with COVID. Uh, not exactly, and, and I want to dig a little deep why, uh, but certainly official supply has tightened and uh, official figures have dropped from 40,000 tonnes exported in 2017 to 8,500 tonnes in 21. Now, by comparison... Last year, the final last quarter of 2022, we mined 15,000 tonnes of jadeite at, Marin, at Marundi, which is double the annual production from Burma in the previous year. Now, the reasons that the Chinese give for this drop is that the China, you know, the COVID, the catch and rebels fighting in, in northern Burma where these mines are, but I don't believe that. You know, they'd been fighting for 100 years. And when it comes to jade, they're not opponents, they're partners. Because uh, you can't run such a big business, which is sometimes accounted for for 50% of Burma's GNP, without the protagonists actually getting along. Uh, what I think has caused the damage is that in 2010 to 2017, there was massive mining. The Chinese brought in big mining, mechanical mining equipment, uh, huge earth diggers and, and, and they took vast quantities of jade back into China illegally and left wastelands behind and, and you see tragically a lot of uh, landfalls and uh, falling of, of earth into the pits and uh, water washing away dozens and dozens of miners from dams, water dams bursting. It, it's horrible. Uh, so that was caused by this massive overmining. And this has caused the 
the most usual thing of all with mining. If you don't look for reserves and replace your reserves, you run out. And I think as no exploration and development has been done on these deposits and no new jadeite resource has been found, you know, they're going to run out. Uh, and the situation is extremely interesting. And the other thing that this white paper said was that, which astounded me, frankly, $39 billion of online trading was done in 2021 and $5.6 billion of offline sales in 2021. This is kind of the reverse of what I thought it would be because traditionally I'd thought that the young people didn't like jade. They were a bit sort of grandma or grandpa would give them a, a jade bangle or a bead or something and they'd put it away as a Christmas present or uh, good luck and so on. That's completely reversed. $39 billion of online trading of jewellery in 2021. This is middle of COVID raking through the country. They still spent an awful lot of money. And the average age of the buyers, the range of buyers was from 18 to 34, and 75% of the buyers were women. So there's a trend. There's a change in, in an industry that needs to be watched. Now, they expect growing demand in this, but they've said themselves that if demand is not met from Burma, they're going to look, have to look, look elsewhere. And one of the respected writers in this journal said that they should be preparing for depletion of the Burmese deposits. Now, of course, one side of me thought, oh, that's good news. But then one has to wonder, you know, what would be the impact of that happening? I don't think it will happen, but I think there's going to be certain really reductions in production from Burma. And where are they going to go to? There's only one other place, and that's Itmarundi in Kazakhstan. That's fascinating. Um, so, so we can see that the jadeite markets are evolving uh, quite rapidly, both both online and and mm -hmm. offline and online. Um, maybe Otto, who, who's here, can give us some more insight into what Web three could do for that jadeite industry mm. going forwards. Yeah, sure. No, Kevin, it's interesting you say uh, you talk about the thirty eight billion dollar online industry, and one mm. of the like one of the massive benefits of Web three is sort of the access and it's an amazing sort of distribution mechanic um, for everyone around the world to be able to, to be able to access, I don't know, anything really, real world assets. But in this instance, Jadeite. Um, and I just sort of, in my head, imagining what happens if you sort of release that $38 billion online trade and you allow it to be accessed by the entire world. I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how big that would get pretty quickly. Um, so you've got this amazing access global access that web3 networks provide um and obviously an, another aspect is kind of the authenticity we can um ensure with web3 and blockchain I and mean, i'm just not going to sort of go into details of why blockchain is amazing for authenticity um because that's that's sort of a concept in, in itself but hopefully you guys sort of know the benefits that you know you have an immutable um database where st something can't be changed and so mm -hmm. you'll be able to actually you have a global access from all these people um to be able to trade on a universal secondary market authentic pieces of jade um where now it's not really possible and so sort of our mission is to take this rather opaque um market in china um and especially you know um it's not a particularly um, sort of the way the Burmese army is controlling the market at the moment um, is often to refer to there as blood jade. And so we're flipping that model and through it, Rundi, um, we're being able to mine it sort of in the, in the ESG way that's, um, that's sort of more compatible with its values of healing and um, those sides. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's probably important to flip the question a bit as well because like what can Jada actually bring to Web3? Because at the moment we've, we're have we through this turbulent condition where, you know, these bad actors have caused a huge lack of trust um, in, the, in, the, in the industry. And I think what's going to happen over the next bit is 
the token, tokenization of these sort of real world assets um, is going to really be, bring trust back into the system. Um, and another thing Jadeite's got going for it, which is sort of inherent in its culture, is that it brings with it this sort of amazing narrative. Um, and through that, we're going to be able to create some really, really valuable sort of storytelling, drawing from all parts of the globe, not just China. Um, and we're going to be able to create sort of this empire in itself um, that all the world can access um, and sort of, you know, have access to this amazing stone that, to be honest, you know, not many people know about it. No, well, we hope to change that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the idea. There's a job ahead, but uh, we're, we're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, but so Kevin, wrapping up, what, what have you concluded about the industry? Um, I guess, where is JRL placed right now and uh, where, do, where do you see it heading? Well, um, we own the biggest mine, jade mine in the world. We've certified it as Fetsui Jadeite. Uh, back in 2018, Mark Denning, Bulat and James and I had a number of conversations about uh, how we entered the market. Did we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chinese in the jewellery sector and just flood it with our jade? Because it's kind of similar. You know, Once it gets down to jewellery, it's very, very difficult to tell the difference. Uh, we decided not to do that because... We did. We don't mind being disruptors, but we want to be positive disruptors, not negative disruptors, and, and drive prices down and so on. Because with our reserves, um, we would probably have seven to ten to twenty years of supply if we really put our mind to it, which can only end badly. Uh, so we decided to focus on luxury architectural stone industry. We're we're entering this industry and have been. Into entering it from a position where we have no competition. There's, there's zero competition. No one's offering jade tiles or, as we said, jade bathtubs, uh, translucent, beautifully lit jade panels. Uh, uh, so we don't have any competition, but we have an unlimited market. Uh, we're going to be complementing the worldwide stone industry by introducing this new conflict-free commodity, as you say, Otto. And uh, we've got hundreds of applications. And uh, the key disruptors I see are that our move into this industry will change it, will positively impact it, will offer jade and luxury stone uh, designers and so on new products, something really valuable that will take jade to the world. One of my missions is to bring jade from the focus of just Chinese and Asian markets to the rest of the world. And the only way you can do that is with interesting products, not just jewellery. Uh, it's got to be stuff, you know, and everything from, you name it, just everything that can be made out of stone can be made out of our jade. So... We're going to transform it into a new international commodity. Uh, and, and people will, will look at apartment fittings, hotel and building features, uh, tiles, mosaics, yacht fittings, automobile fittings, uh, high-end jewellery stuff with, with odd applications. And the, the thing we're going to be distinguishing from, say, other jadeite, Burmese, which all you know is that it comes from Burma, is that every piece we create of value will have its own exclusive QR ID code and potentially tracking. It'll show the provenance of the product from the mine, its independent certification, who cut it, who polished it, who fabricated it, and where it's been sitting for. And, and this is partly the model, the initial model of our teamwork with our partners, Jade Vault. We're, we're providing... Jade Vault with super cheap jade, incredibly cheap jade. I don't know why I did it. But, uh, <laughs> You're such a nice guy, Kevin. That's we're like... doing it. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to allow that to flow to where people can uh, use jade, acquire jade as a storage of wealth and then see what can happen there. So really, uh, it's... It's great, and we want lots and lots of people to join us on this jade road journey. 
Amazing. And Will, that's why you know we got involved as well. Maybe you could finish us up with just uh, quickly going through the opportunity for Jade Bolt there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's incredible. I was in the mining industry for 13 years and then sold and got out of it and that, never thought I'd come back. But this, is, uh, oh. but this has brought me back into the mining industry uh, because I've never seen anything like it in my whole life. Um, you know, it's just to put things into perspective, you know, if you take annual production of Jade's you know 35,000 tons you know this deposit's got a couple of hundred thousand uh 200,000 and probably by the time expiration's finished four or five hundred thousand um you know there's enough jade out here to supply the world ultimately um and that's why jade vault and jade city become very important because by by creating a digital trading platform uh for the jades you're really uh, democratizing the access to it um, you're allowing anybody anywhere in the world to trade it and that in turn um, will grow the market you know because you know I'd like to win well I do own some jade because Kevin gave me some but I, I generally like if I, if I wasn't you know I'd quite like to win some jade but you know how would I go about buying it it's very hard to know that when you buy it it's the real stuff or it hasn't been dyed or treated in some way and and between Jade Vault and Jade City that it kind of gets rid of all that it allows anybody literally somebody with zero knowledge um, to store their you know to store part of their wealth in Jade like they might store part of their wealth in gold um, it allows them to buy beautiful things hold beautiful things and, it, and they can do all of it and they don't even have to take physical delivery of, of the items you know, until they actually want to. Uh, they can just hold them as digital assets and trade them with anybody anywhere in the world. Uh, and I think that's just like a huge opportunity. That's why I'm incredibly excited about it. Um, it's all I think about. I think it's all anybody in the team thinks about because everybody in the team's, you know, been since the beginning. Um, it's just extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity for, for us as a team and, you know, for our shareholders, I like to believe as well. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, we've covered all our questions for Kevin. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your insight. Sure. Happy um, to, guys. Cheers. And yeah, um, do comment any further questions below the space and we'll be more than happy to come back and answer them. Also, our, our wait list is live online. If you haven't already registered, you can do that now at jadecity.io. And uh, I think that's all for today. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.